Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's wonderful to be with you here um, and to talk today about the role of GM crops in global development. You can tell by the list of positions that I've held over the years that I've never been able to hold down a job. Um, and you can tell from what I'm doing in retirement that I can't hold down retirement either. So it's a, it's a difficult life. But given, given I've not been successful in holding down jobs or holding down retirement, I'm doubly honored to be invited to, uh, to talk with you today. So thank you, Sarah. Today, I'm going to talk about when to use GM crops, the impact of GM crops, the potential of GM crops, and a strategy for technology transfer of GM crops to developing countries. I imagine everyone in this room knows buckets more than I do about biotechnology. But just in case, let me share with you how I'm defining the, uh, the uh, term GM crops. They're developed by the selective addition of a genetic trait from any source without addition of non-desired genes. I just thought I'd put that in case there's anyone here from the economics department. Yes, there is, David. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, when to use GM crops. I want to make it clear that I'm not gonna stand here and convince you all that GM technology is the only way to do agriculture these days. I see GM crops as a tool in the toolbox, one of many tools that we can, use, can be used according to the situation one finds oneself in. It's not a silver bullet. It's not a panacea. It's a complement to other approaches. And it should be used, in my opinion, only when other measures are too lengthy, too expensive, or simply unavailable to do the job. Now that might sound obvious to many of you, but a lot of people who stand up and talk about GM crops tend to preach that they are the way and there's no other way as we look down the road. The other side preaches that they are the only thing we should not use. I'm just trying to indicate to you how incredibly balanced I am. And those of you who have known me, <laughs> that actually that was not a joke. Um, and, uh, but uh, those of you who know me know that I was lying. Uh, um, so this is my attitude towards GM crops. And what are the impacts of GM crops to date? Quite magnificent, in fact. Now, I don't, am I allowed to stand in front of this one? Or? I think so, yeah. Yeah, I can't read it otherwise. Oh, I see, yeah. Ah, OK. <laughs> Let's look at how the glow, no. Let's look at how the global area of biotech crops has gone since 1996. In terms of total hectares, it's gone up to more than 170 million hectares worldwide. In industrial countries, we're talking about somewhere in the 60 million mark. And for developing countries on the bottom there, we're talking about having actually overtaken industrialized countries uh, in, that, in that same range. Last year, a record 17.3 million farmers in 28 countries, eight of which are industrialized, 20 are developing countries, um, grew commercially GM crops. This is an increase of 6% uh, over 2011. In one year, there's a 6% increase, which is quite remarkable. And you can see from the dark green around the globe which are the countries, the 28 countries that are growing those crops commercially. There are crops being grown under experimental conditions in many more countries than that. But we're talking here about commercial production. When we look at the actual crops that make up the, the bulk of the GM crops that are being grown, we have, sorry, I haven't quite got the hang of this, uh, soybean being the leader, then maize, cotton and canola. They are the ones that make up the bulk of the global production GM crops. And by the way, I owe a, a lot to 
uh, Clive James and Randy Hortea of uh, ISAR, International Service for the Acquisition of Agri Biotech. What's the other bit? Applications. Applications. I went for an interview with them once and I didn't get the name of the company right and this did not go well. <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> luckily Ronnie saved me again, brought me back. Um, so, um, but they're very kind in, in delivering this kind of information to the world and to me usually about a day before I'm going to give a seminar and forget that I haven't had an update yet. So those are the main ones and that's very important to remember. It's four crops that make up the vast bulk of GM crops being, being grown today. In terms of the traits that have been incorporated into those crops, we're talking about herbicide tolerance, insect resistance and a combination thereof. So until this point, there's a very limited number of crops that make up the bulk of the GM crops being grown and an even more limited number of traits, basically two traits in some cases put together. This is, this is the vast amount of GM crops that are going around the world at the moment. But you'll see soon that there are many, many more possibilities than that. In terms of just talking about the impact that GM crops have had so far, you can see here that between 1996 and 2011, economic gains at the farm level were, <coughs> excuse me, 98.2 billion US dollars. We are not talking about some little niche market here. Since 1996, biotech crops have reduced the amount of pesticides used by 473 million kilograms. And in 2011 alone, fewer insecticide and herbicide sprays reduced carbon dioxide emissions by 23.1 billion kilograms. So remember that when you're hearing arguments against GM crops, based on environmental problems and so on. There are some environmental issues which we will look at. But you remember this side of the coin too. These are pretty impressive numbers. I think it sometimes makes a subject more important to look at a specific issue, a case. And I, I want to talk with you about the case of the Zulu farmers in the Makatini Flats region of KwaZulu-Natal in South America, uh, South Africa. Um, oops. KwaZulu, KwaZulu Natal is here, just north of uh, Durban. It's a pretty wild area. And the farmers in this area, their only cash crop is cotton. And in the early, in the early 1990s, chemical control of the main insect pest, the American bollworm, which by the way, some of the South Africans, they really don't like that term. Why can't it be the African bollworm, they say? <laughs> I didn't have an answer for that. I always called it the English bollworm. <laughs> that didn't go down too well with the Afrikaners, I tell you. But um, basically, uh, the control of this had become inadequate and the cotton industry, remember this is their only cash crop, was going like this, straight down the drain. And we're talking about farmers here who typically might have one or two hectares to grow their crops on. And they were growing some cotton because they needed the cash. The Zulu farmers were amongst the first to adopt the technology uh, which uh, was introduced in 1999 to South Africa. BT cotton I imagine everyone here knows what BT means, is insect resistant GM uh, technology. Um, provided effective control of the bollworm and saved their cash crop. They got increased yield, they reduced their ne need for chemical pesticides, they increased yields and reduced chemical applications uh, to the extent that it outweighed the higher cost of the seed. Often you'll hear critics of this technology saying, but it costs the farmers more to buy those seeds. Yes, it does. But their increased outputs and their decreased need for inputs more than made up for that. 
By the way, I do know this from the Zulu farmers themselves because I was out there evaluating the impact of BT cotton. So I do have a personal attachment and association with this particular place. Their reduced health risks have less and less instances now of uh, farmers or their children uh, stirring up the pesticide with their hands and arms which is what they used to do is they, they use masses and masses of this stuff just to try and save the, the, uh, the cotton. And there's a resurgence of predators and parasitoids. I was taken through the fields there by an entomologist who had worked there for more than 30 years. And he was so thrilled because he had lovely things like lace wings, assassin bugs. When you hear the word assassin bugs in a place like the Makatini Flats, you want to know an explanation of exactly what that means. And, and the gormages. And he said, oh, I've never seen anything like this since 30 years ago. All these natural predators of the boll worm came back and were helping to control the boll worm along with the BT cotton because they weren't getting killed by the chemicals. So what about risks? There's a chance that if you grow BT cotton or any other BT crop, too intensively, you're going to produce an insect pest population that will be too resistant to the BT. You'll challenge the population to such an extent that the few insects that survive are super resistant. They're a super population. They go on to breed and eventually you get this spiral of, of the uh, insects becoming completely immune to BT. Of course, this happens for many other chemical modes of defense too. Um, but having said that, what do we do about that? In this country and many other countries where BT uh, cotton or other BT other crops, corn, etc., are grown, there are special management techniques that are used, agronomic techniques, to combat that effect of producing a superpopulation. Um, but for that, you need a good extension system. Well, when I asked my Africana colleague from Delta and Pine, who was uh, escorting me around this part of South Africa, could I see the extension service in action? This is not the actual vehicle we saw as he explained what the extension service was like. But the, in that particular area, there was one vehicle and it was broken down and just been left, rather like this poor vehicle here. So luckily, some of the companies who were selling the BT cotton did their own extension work, but extension's really lacking. So this is a real risk that you could land up with badly managed crops and super pest populations being developed because how can you get to all these far-flung places in that area unless you've got a good extension system? And this is something that worries me about deploying these kinds of crops around the world in developing countries where the extension is not <coughs> extensive. However, up to this date, there are no instances of BT cotton causing harm to human health or environment in South Africa or anywhere else. Let's get to the nitty gritty of this GM crop issue. It's people's perceptions. It's not just the science, it's people's perceptions. I want to show you two different perceptions. This one is from an activist group called BioWatch commenting on the uh, failure of BT cotton in South Africa since I was there in the early 2000s. Quote, BT cotton has not proved to be sustainable in terms of reducing pesticide use, nor in terms of improving income for farmers. Can't get much more negative than that. It is clear that BT cotton and many other GM crops will fail the majority of farmers throughout Africa. Pretty damning statement there from those activists. Let's have a bit of a contrast. This is from a report in Nature Biotechnology 
about the same time as that BioWatch report was produced, very careful study done and reported in this journal, the area under cotton in South Africa fell 80% due to the lowest cotton price in 30 years, the strong rand, the currency of South Africa, severe flooding, prolonged droughts on the Makatini Flats, the area I was talking about with the Zulus, and lack of credit, which resulted in substantial losses to farmers, leading to drastically reduced cotton plantings. It's not the GM technology. Those things were in, in, in abeyance when the other report was given. GM technology had nothing to do with it. The GM technology is so dear to the hearts of the Zulu farmers, and I, I can't, I can't uh, give this talk without one personal anecdote, and I'm sorry for those already yawning in the, in the audience. Um, <laughs> when I went to the Makatini Flats, I was with this Africana, okay? Now, Africanas in English haven't always got on well. Uh, for example, during the Boer War. And the Zulus and the English haven't got on well. And a lot of people haven't got on well with the English, actually. Um, but uh, like Ronnie doesn't, uh, Ronnie's, uh, I said he was prejudiced against the British. And he said in his eloquent way, I'm not prejudiced. I said, well, what are you? And he said, I'm biased. <laughs> I said, having had a very poor English education, I didn't really know the difference, so I asked him. And he said, when you're biased, you have a reason. <laughs> and he was looking straight at me when he said, all right, back to this point. There's some Humphrey fellows here who, who I'm always on to keep to time. And they, they've got their stopwatches, and I have to be careful. Um, all right, then. So here we have two different perceptions. We have extremes. And that's what exists mainly in the whole world of GM crop technology, extremes. And this is something we all have to try and combat. We have to deal with facts. We have to deal case by case as to whether GM crops are useful or not. OK, we've looked then at, oh, sorry, the Africana. I don't see any clamoring for this, but I'll tell you anyway. Um, so we were, we were there surrounded by Zulus. It sounds rather dramatic, doesn't it? And they all had these farming implements, which looked rather like weapons to me. And they were right way around me. And I was with this guy. Guess what his name was? Jan, um, the Afrikaner. And the Zulu chief asked him in, in Zulu language, he said, is this man here to take away our special cotton, meaning the BT cotton? And Jan told me in English, he said, this is a very, very difficult moment for me. <laughs> um, because on the one hand, I'm with Delton Pine, we're selling BT cotton and all that. On the other hand, you're English, I am an Africana, and this is the first time I've had a chance to actually get an Englishman killed without doing it myself. <laughs> so anyway, um, he, uh, he told them that I was not there to take it away, and they sort of rested, rather pointedly rested their weapons, uh, sorry, implements. So we've looked then at some of the uh, impacts of GM crops to date with a very few traits and very few major crops, the internationally traded big time crops. Let's look at the enormous potential of these crops. The next generation of GM crops includes those that have biotic stress, abiotic stress tolerance, nutritional enhancement, and can be made into functional foods, and disease resistance. As we look ahead, we have a vast range of traits available to us. I was first made aware of this whole topic back in the late uh, 90s when uh, Susan McCooch and Steve Tanksley wrote a paper uh, in, in science, I think it was, um, about the enormous potential of genomics for identifying genes that can then be fished out of any crop and then plugged in to your target crop varieties to improve them pretty much for any kind of trait. And that inspired me at that time, and it still does, especially when I think about the progress that's been made in actually achieving that. So here we are with this whole area of genomics, bioinformatics, 
which are facilitating this uh, identification, isolation, and through GM technology, transfer the genes. Results in increased ability to extract these needed genes from, let's say, germplasm collections, I think are going to revolutionize the whole agricultural field. When I worked at the International uh, Potato Center, we had a massive collection of potatoes. Yes, wild potatoes, other potatoes, etc. And we were trying to use the valuable genes from those for disease resistance, for drought tolerance, etc., etc., in modern varieties around the world. You know, after 20, 20 years of the, the potato center being in, in action, they had used less than 7% of the potato collection. 7%. And believe me, it was not because the people there were lazy. It's because they had a lot to do. As soon as they got the genes transferred over from, the, say, a wild potato, or one that might have late blight resistance, and put that into a cultivated uh, variety, they had to then back cross over years and years. If they could make the cross in the first place between the wild potato and the commercial one, and the back crossing could take years and years and years. Here we're talking about using genomics and bioinformatics to identify the specific late blight genes in that wild potato, pull that gene or genes out and plug it through genetic engineering, sometimes through tissue culture techniques and so on, into the target variety, leaving the genes that one does not need behind, thus eliminating much of the back crossing that has to go on to make a decent cultivar. So this is a very, very important issue in terms of looking ahead at the future of genomics and GM crop technology. This, in turn, better use of the germplasm collections will strengthen efforts to conserve biodiversity. I think we may be coming near to the end of the time when we can simply ask donors, oh, we'd like more and more and more money to keep this plant museum going in the field. They want to know it's being used. It's like my doctor said to me, use it or lose it, and you see what happened to me. So anyway, I'm talking about my muscles, by the way. <laughs> um, so another point is, as we, as we utilize these genes in the plant germplasm collections and are switching genes from one plant to another, often even within the same species, this may have a very positive effect on the public's perception, maybe the perception of others who are against GM technology, because that's more palatable to many than saying, well, actually, we're going to take this fish gene and put it in your tomatoes or something like that, or the BT, the soil bacterial gene, and put it into your maize. I mean, it, it just it has a perception a difference there. So I think there's a, there's a great future for GM technology combined with genomics to move us ahead and be able to solve many, many more problems in many, many more crops. Let's move beyond the major crops. Remember I was talking about soybean, corn, and so on, canola. Um, and think about the fact that many crops around the world have been overlooked or downplayed in terms of research programs. The multinationally traded crops are the ones that have got the big attention from the big life sciences companies that have done miraculous research in pioneering GM technology, along with good universities, et cetera, et cetera. But they have been the spearhead. They were not going to go in for these other crops, so-called orphan crops. Oh, I'm sorry. I wish I had the hang of this. She switched lasers on me at the last moment, um, which cover 240 million hectares in developing countries alone that are not focused on in this, in this big life sciences company mode. And there is enormous potential for developing those orphan crops. 
So how would we go about doing that? Well, at Cornell, Cornell's been doing this for, what is it now, 12 years, Ronnie, I think. And there's people in this room, and including myself, who work together to develop a strategy that would try to achieve this. And it's all wrapped up within the Agricultural Biotechnology Support Project number two. Guess what? There was a number one, um, or ABSP2. As I say, it's been going for 12 years, and it's here at Cornell. It's led uh, by uh, the director, Dr. Frank Shotkowski. But it all started 12 years ago when a group of us at Cornell and several people in this room who, who did it, there's Ronnie, I think KV walked in earlier on. I um, don't know whether Bill Lesser is here, but if I've missed out anyone, I apologize. But a group of people here at Cornell working with people from Africa and Asia to put together this proposal, really this strategy, to see if we could, we could find a way, an efficient way, a fast way of developing GM orphan crops. You'll see what I mean by that in a minute. So this is a USAID project. It's very, oh, it's very much a product-driven approach. That might sound odd to you. Well, why wouldn't it be? Product meaning the GM crop, the final thing you want to deliver. Many university projects are not like that. This, here we're trying to take on more of the, the industry mode be very pragmatic and think, what do we want out there as the, as the product? And we wanted this approach, one, because of course, we wanted to boost productivity and sustainability via the products themselves, the new GM crops. We wanted to provide real life lessons and experiences to the developing country partners that we had in actually getting hands on putting those products through the system, learning about all the various aspects, not just technical, but others that we'll see in a minute as they went through. They'd had lots of workshops, good workshops done by ABSP1, which was based at Michigan State, and they had that background from which we could springboard off into dealing with the products themselves, getting this hands-on experience, um, thus building national and regional biotech capacity to try to build a portfolio of success stories about impacts in farmers' fields. Couldn't resist putting up a, a, a quote from an Englishman here, Sir Arthur Helps, that's a wonderful name, I think, as opposed to Sir Arthur Hinders or something like that. <laughs> um, Nothing succeeds like success. The idea is to build, build, build your portfolio of successes through effective products, through effective capacity building via those products. Nothing succeeds like success. And under the leadership of Frank Shotkowski, uh, K.V. Rahman, uh, Ronnie Kaufman, and the people we're working with around the world, you will see that success has followed success. Um, so what's the approach we've taken? What was the this basic strategy that we adopted? It was to take a holistic, well, first of all, product-based, demand-driven. We actually took the ludicrous step of going to these various countries at the beginning of the, of the project and finding out what people wanted. Now, that was a hard sell to USAID. Oh, sorry, I didn't say that. But basically, um, we, we had to do that. They said, well, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to ask people what to do. And we did. And eventually, they gave in and gave us six months to find out what we were going to do demand-driven, holistic approach, looking at all these different elements, not just the technology. By the way, for that bioengineered product, read GM crops for the sake of this presentation. Looking at policy, which include intellectual property and regulatory issues, outreach and communications issues, and marketing and distribution issues. Unless all of those are looked at together at the, from the beginning of the project onwards, then you could easily lose. Public-private efforts, we've heard a lot about public-private efforts, but it's rarely that you see them actually in action. 
and one of the foundations of ABSP2 is for public and private sectors in the various developing countries and within the states to work together on each product. Capacity building, as I said, is a major part of all this in all these different areas. Um, impact assessment right from the start to make sure we know how things are going and what to do in terms of when they don't go well. Several products were, were picked out early on and were dropped, which is unusual also for university work. I've not been critical about university work, it's just that I was involved in it for so many details and I don't remember dropping a product because it might not have the impact, I hope. There was always some scientific reason for carrying on with it and whatever. Maybe you're different for me, I don't know. But, um, and then product stewardship, making sure that when that product gets out there, it's being used in, in the right way. You don't get into problems of super pest populations and so on. So um, among the products that were selected through discussions with the developing countries in Africa and Asia, uh, were these uh, listed here. And what I'd like to do is to focus, oh, sorry, on this uh, first one, the fruit and shoot borer resistant eggplant or brinjal as it's called in, uh, in uh, various parts of uh, South Asia, like, like uh, India, for example, and Bangladesh. And again, trying to give you a concrete example of something rather than generalize all the time. So here it is, BT eggplant for resistance to shoot and fruit borer. And this was particularly designed to help out farmers who were financially constrained, generally small scale farmers. So the eggplant is a key crop in India, Bangladesh and the Philippines, the countries in which we've mainly worked. There's 470,000 hectares in India alone. It's common to all income groups, but including those small scale farmers. This is what the, uh, oops, sorry. This is what the uh, plant looks like when it's attacked by the fruit and shoot borer. I was being fairly uh, conservative in saying that there was 50 to 70% yield loss fruit and shoot borer. You can actually get in some farmers field 100% loss. So there goes a source of food and a source of cash for them right there because of the fruit and shoot borer. So the current pest control measures involve masses of, of applications of chemical pesticides. They're a major threat to the environment. There are stories of farmers not eating their own eggplants because of how much pesticide was put on them, just selling them. Um, and, uh, as a fruit and shoot borer develops resistance to all these chemicals, then you need more and more pesticide. And you can apply that if you're lucky enough to be able to buy it in the first place and daring enough to use so much of it. Um, so it, it's a pretty serious situation, the way things are being handled right now. Um, we found that an alternative was the um, BT eggplant to make eggplant with BT in it. And through our studies, both technically and economically, it turned out this was a good alternative. Um, and um, we went ahead. So the expected impact of BT eggplant in India is reduction of crop losses and pesticide use, reduced health and environmental risks, savings in crop production cost and a positive economic impact just in India alone of $164 million per annum and provision of food to several million people at affordable costs. So what's the situation there with that wonderful technology? Well, the BT eggplant in com combination with uh, Indian colleagues at uh, Mahiko Hybrid Seed Company um, <coughs> and uh, with, uh, with various other partners out there, Safguru Associates, who are really the, the um, spearhead of our work out there. You have to have someone on, on the ground there making sure things are happening and uh, 
they, they do, they really do. Uh, Vijay Raghavan is the, the chief of that. He's a real dynamo and done wonderful things in keeping this going. In six years, we went from no product to BT eggplant that was doing well in field trials as well as lab trials, had, had shown up well in terms of the regulatory tests. There's a massive dossier of tests that have been done at it in terms of the regulatory aspects to make sure there's no environmental or health risks associated with it. And you would think, well, that's just a massive success story. The main focus was on India. The Indian government seemed very, very pleased with the whole thing, were very helpful. And we were about to have this BT eggplant commercialized when guess what? Uh, Greenpeace and their associates uh, managed to persuade the Ministry of Environment that this should not go through, should not be commercialized. Even though the central body in India that deals with giving the yes or no uh, indication for commercialization of a GM crop had said yes. So Greenpeace, who are brilliant activists, they are very persuasive. They managed to convince the Ministry of Environment that they should stop this from being commercialized. And that's the way it stands right now. Um, however, just a few days ago in Bangladesh, which was a, a secondary uh, place for us to work, uh, just because we felt we should focus on one place, get that through, and that might lead to successes elsewhere. Bangladesh has just approved commercial BT eggplant uh, cultivation just a few days ago. And we're hoping that will have some positive effect. So if anyone would like to read more about this, uh, how am I doing for time? Any Humphrey fellows here who would like to? Am I OK still, Ahmed? I asked, the, I asked him because he's always so nice to me. All right, well, go. <laughs> he's gone. I guess that says something. OK, but um, if you'd like to read more about this, uh, the ABSP2 website's a good place to go. But also, um, we wrote this paper a few years ago that summed up the whole strategy, actually used BT eggplant as the, uh, the, the special case. And uh, please, uh, please, if you feel like it, read that or just get back in touch with me or Ronnie or KV Raman and, and the others, Bill Lesser, and the people around the world who, uh, who developed this, uh, this strategy. So thank you very much indeed. I appreciate your time and listening.